how to start. Okay, so um, this lecture about virtual topologies, it is, um, I wouldn't say it's advanced, it's it's something that some people don't use, but some, some people do, it's very useful. I did consider at one point um, a few years ago, maybe not giving this lecture in the first MPI course and saving it for the advanced one I do. But then I read the book, which I mentioned, uh, I, I, it's in the slides, um, the, the, the MPI book by uh, Grop, Lusk and Skellum. And they have a very interesting initial chapter where they, they, they talk about things what they were thinking about doing when they designed MPI, but also what they're proud of, what they think uh, makes MPI better than its predecessors uh, and, and, and why it's uh, stayed the test of, of time. And one of the things they're very proud of are virtual topologies. And so I, I decided they are very useful. Actually, for a number of reasons, they've become more useful recently. So I'm going to talk, I'll have to motivate this a bit. Uh, it could be a relatively short talk, but I'll... I, Apologies, I have somebody visiting the house today uh, shortly, and I'm the only person in, so I'm very, I may have to take a 30, a one minute break at some point if someone comes to the door. I'm sorry about that. So I'm going to motivate what virtual topologies are, um, that they're a convenient process naming scheme. So um, when you did the message around a ring, you considered the processes as being in a line. Well, actually, in, 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 in a circle. And, but so you, you, you compute your neighbors at rank plus one and rank minus one. So you implicitly put an ordering on the, on the processes. You thought it was being arranged in a line where rank plus one was next to rank and rank minus one was to the left. That seems quite obvious. But actually, the MPI com world has no structure or topology. It's just a bunch of processes. So you may like to think of it as being a line of processes, but you know, um, it, it might be other things. And we'll see that often it, it, it will be useful in general problems, not just to have lines, but to have 2D grids or 3D grids. So we very, very often want to arrange our processes to be in a grid. We've seen a very simple 1D grid, a line, but you might want 2D grids and, and, and 3D grids. And when you do that, it starts to get tricky to work out who your neighbors are. The, the, the bookkeeping and such like becomes tricky and also, you may think of your process as being on a 3D grid, but MPI doesn't know that. M MPI com world is just a bunch of processes numbered 0 to n minus 1 with no structure. So virtual topologies give you two, um, two things. You can tell MPI that you are thinking of your processes being arranged, in this case, in, in a regular grid. And it also gives you uh, helper functions, bookkeeping functions for doing lookups, neighbors left, right, up, down, forward, backward. So it gives you a naming scheme to fit the communication pattern. You can start to talk about pro the process at grid coordinates 3, 2, 7, rather than process 93. It simplifies the writing of code. Unfortunately, not in the example we're going to do, because if you have a 1D topology, a line, your neighbors are rank plus 1 and rank minus 1, modulo the, the, the circular nature. And so that's rather trivial. But, but, but I've just used that as the exercise to get you to, to, to learn the syntax. But it hopefully simplifies writing code. And more importantly, it's a standard way of writing code. And in principle, it can allow MPI to optimize communication. So what do we do? What we want to do is we want to tell MPI, look, I know MPI can well a bunch of processes, but we're thinking of them as being arranged in a grid. So what we do is we create a, there's a function uh, which produces a new communicator. So we actually say to MPI, we generate a new communicator, and this communicator has all the same uh, processes in it as MPI com world, it contains all the processes, but they're now arranged in a grid. And once you've done that, MPI gives you mapping functions, then you can say, well, who's my process up from me, down from me, left from me, and, 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 and right from me. So this there's mapping functions to compute the processor ranks based on the topology naming scheme. So the model, so so the 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 uh, motivation for the message around a ring example was the traffic model. Uh, where you had a, a, a single lane road arranged in a roundabout. So not only were, so your neighbors were rank plus one and rank minus one, but you also had to take care of the periodic boundary conditions. So the name up from size minus one was zero and down from zero was minus one. However, you can imagine you might want to have a traffic model with multiple lanes. And so all the, 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 you have, here we have four lanes and the cars might actually, I mean, I'm not showing you the much, the cars might actually change lanes. So you have a bunch of, uh, and what happens is that the cars also go off the end 
and come back on this side here. So what we have is, I'll go back and show you that again, is we have a grid here, okay? So we have a grid of one, two, three, four by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We have a four by eight grid, I'm read down and along. And we, we need, if we want to tell MPI, uh, if we want to, we might want to divide this so that each lane is 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 um, is is uh, dealt with by a separate processor, uh, but we split it up in this. So, for example, if we had eight processors, we want one processor to do those four cells, another to do those four, another to those four, another to those four. So we want a grid of processors, which is always four down the way, because um, pro a, a, a process only owns a, a single a single lane, but it might have multiple processes along the way. So if we had 32 processes, sorry, say 16 processes, we might split into a four by four grid, where each um, uh, process has a it, this is an unrealistic small problem has a one a, 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 a lane of length two. So we need to tell MPI two things there. We definitely need to tell MPI that we want we're thinking of our processes being arranged in a four by eight or four by whatever grid. But we also need to tell MPI the boundary conditions because we need to tell it, look, if we go off to the right, the neighbor of the pro process to the right is back down here. So we need to tell MPI that we have periodic or cyclic boundary conditions in that dimension. But we don't have cyclic dimension. That, there's no such thing as up from this car because that's the edge of the motorway. There's nothing there. So we have non-periodic boundary conditions. So when you're, when you're saying your processes are on a 2D grid, you need to tell MPI two things. One is what the dimensions of the grid are. But also you need to tell it what the boundary conditions are, what to do if it looks off the edge in each dimension. So the topology, a Cartesian topology, which is this regular grid, of a process grid, is defined by the number of dimensions, the processes in each dimension, but also the boundary conditions in each dimension. So here in the first dimension, like is, we're, we're non-periodic. So if I say, who's the neighbor up for me? There is nobody, but in this direction, we're periodic. So you can call that a cylinder. OK, so I've, it's a cylinder because it wraps around in this dimension, but not in this dimension. And if I number it like a matrix, I might say that, OK, I, if I have 12 processes, I want to arrange them in, in general into a three by four grid. OK, it's natural not to talk about this as process six, but talk about it to give it grid coordinates, to say talk about the process at coordinates one comma two. It's fairly obvious that the neighbors of the process at one, two are zero, two, 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 one, one, and one, three. We just add and subtract one to each dimension. It's not obvious that the neighbors of rank six are two, five, seven, and 10. There's a bit of bookkeeping to do there. So once you've defined the topology, you can start to think about processes that are having grid coordinates here, 2D grid coordinates. And that makes things a lot simpler uh, uh, in terms of thinking about things. Also, there's a standard mapping uh, that if you have 12 processes in a three by four grid, uh, process two is at grid, grid coordinates naught comma two. It uses the C type um, convention where the second index moves fastest. If you're a Fortran programmer, you would think of that as being, uh, that would be uh, maybe a process, um, you would think of it being different. But, the, but MPI always uses this convention. Okay. So what we want to do to get this example is tell MPI we've got 12 processes, the range in a three by four grid. We also need to tell it in the first dimension here, it's non-periodic, and in the second dimension, it's periodic. So there are actually two types of topologies. What I've been talking about so far are called Cartesian topologies. Each process is connected with neighbors in a virtual grid. The, the, the other point is when you tell MPI that you're using a Cartesian topology, that your process is arranged in a grid, MPI will then assume that you are doing nearest neighbor communications. If you say that the process is on a grid, it will assume that this process is communicating with its four neighbors. And that allows it to make, in principle, to make various optimizations that we'll talk about later. Um, so each process is connected to its neighbors in a virtual grid. The boundaries can be cyclic or not. Now, when you create the topology, you can optionally reorder the ranks to allow MPI to optimize for underlying network connectivity. I'll come back to that. Uh, I'll come back to that. But then the processes are identified by Cartesian coordinates, and that's very useful. You can actually um, define more general graph topology. A graph is an unstructured mesh where any process is connected to an arbitrary number of neighbors. Um, but um, we, I don't cover them here because they're 
they're not as useful and they're not as widely used. But you, if, 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 you, if you say to yourself, look, I don't have a structured problem, my, my processes aren't, don't live in a 2D or 3D grid, it's unstructured, um, I have an unstructured mesh or a graph, then there is a way of telling MPI that you create a graph topology. But it's more complicated to create because you, you have to say for every rank, how many neighbors does it have and who are they? So you have to list lots of lookup tables. The, the Cartesian topologies are much easier to, to, to get to grips with. So how do we create a Cartesian topology? What we do is there's a routine called cart create. So we give it an old communicator and that would normally be something like Comworld. And then we say, okay, Comworld, which has say 12 processes, we want it to be arranged in a two dimensional grid where the, uh, we give it the dimensions, which are three comma four in, uh, in this example here, three comma four. We would say whether it's periodic, so that will be false, true or uh, zero one. Uh, we, we, we tell MPI if we allow it to reorder them and we get back a new communicator, which is which is where, which is has the same processes as Comwell, but Comcart, a Cartesian communicator, has a structure. You can then you can then inquire who are my neighbors. Now I'll talk about the reordering here. Um, the question: once you've imposed this topology, MPI knows or will assume that you're communicating with your nearest neighbors. It may then realize that the default allocation of processes to physical process sort is not optimal, that it might lead to lots of communication. For example, the processes that communicate with each other a lot, you want to be on the same node so they don't go over the network. So in principle, you can say reorder equals true, and that allows MPI to renumber, logically renumber the, the ranks so that the communications is minimized. Now you have to be careful if you do that because it means your rank in the new communicator is not the same as the rank in the old communicator because you have been renumbered. So you need to recompute that. To be honest, I tend to do reorder equals false. Um, many MPI implementations don't take advantage of this of this functionality, and many that do do a bad job. So I, I, I typically use reorder equals false. Now, I'm, not, I'm fairly blase made a statement that we have 12 processes and we want them to a three by four grid. But imagine you were running on 2098 processes and you wanted them in a 3D grid. Well, I can't factor 2019 to factor 98 to factor three in my head. And so often you have a large number of processes you want to factor into a grid and you, you want MPI to suggest something. So MPI gives a helper function with MPI to create. This takes and calls it nodes. It's actually the number of processes and it arranges them and it suggests a grid. So, you know, if you had 120 processes and said you wanted them in a 2D grid, it would probably suggest 10 by 12 or 12 by 10, something nice and balanced. As I said, for, 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 for two dimensional grids, it's relatively easy to work out, but for three or more dimensions, it gets quite tricky to do the math, to decompose it into products of prime factors and stuff. So, so this is just a helper routine. It will suggest a nice balanced process of decomposition. So what, typically what you do is you do MPI com size to work out how many there are. You do MPI dim to create where MPI will suggest what the dimension you, you say I want to de I want to decompose or arrange these processes into a logical 3D grid and it will suggest dimensions which give a sense for decomposition and then you will use those dimensions in your call to MPI card create. You don't have to use those you can use what you want. Now you might say that's all very good but we saw in the traffic model that we always wanted the first dimension to be four. There are four lanes so we want four processes in the first dimension. So, but you can you can also express constraints. So you can actually say to MPI, I've got a thousand processes, I want them in a 3D grid. And by the way, the middle dimension has to be 20, for example. And so uh, the, the way you do that is that when you call MPI DIMS create, you get back an array which contains the dimensions. That's the little array of what the dimensions are. However, on entry, if one of those numbers is non-zero, MPI takes that as a constraint. So if you want to give MPI complete, complete freedom, which you normally do, you would initialize DIMS to zero, call MPI DIMS create, MPI would say, okay, David wants a thousand processes into a 3D grid and DIMS is zero, so I've got complete freedom. However, if any DIMS is non-zero, it takes that as a constraint. So if we look at something, if before the call DIMS is zero, zero, you do MPI DIMS create with six, two DIMS, I've got six processes on a two dimensional grid, it'll probably give you back something like three, two. If you say 
you can do what you like. I've got seven processes I want the two dimensional grid, but there's only two answers because seven is prime, seven, one, or one, seven. You might say I've got six processes, I want a 3D grid, and the middle dimension has to be three, or there's only two answers, two, three, one, or one, three, two. Of course, you can give erroneous calls. You can say I've got seven processes, I want a three dimensional grid, and by the way, the middle dimension has to be three, that's an erroneous call. So it's important to note that non-zero values in DIMS sets the number of processes required in that direction. So make sure DIMS is set to zero before the call. So this allows you to, to compute and, 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 and arrange your processes in a grid and you get back a new communicator, which is called a Cartesian communicator. Are there any questions about that? I mean, it's, it's a relatively sort of more esoteric topic we've talked about before, but it is, it is useful to know about. Um, are there any questions about this? So if not, yep. So this isn't anything to do with process pinning. This isn't, um, this, this isn't, so this is, this is independent of process pinning. Um, so most MPI implementations, especially those developed, the, the, uh, designed for high performance computing will pin the processes by default it that will pin them so 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 you don't have to worry about that you should never do it yourself s run or mpi run on most systems will pin the processes to the processors and there will be ways of controlling how that is done uh, but that will be done for you and all this does is control which processes are pinned to which so there'll be a default mapping i mean the default mapping will be on Archer 2, the first 128 process ranks 0 to 127 on node 1, on node 0, 128 to 257 on node 1, etc. That will be the default mapping. If you do MPI, if you allow it to reorder, there will, there will be a non-default mapping. Rank 7 could be somewhere else. But they will still be pinned. They'll just be pinned to a different place. Does that, does that answer your question? But process pinning is, 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 is orthogonal to this. This is talking, you know, this, this is slight, that's slightly different. But you don't need to you don't need to worry about uh, process pinning. That will be done for you. Uh, um, that will be done for you. Okay. Whoops, I'm in the wrong window. So once you've created crises and quality, you can ask things like you want to ask uh, what are the coordinates of rank seven. Uh, who is the who is the process? What is the rank of the process at coordinates two comma three comma seven, for example? So MPI cart rank takes grid coordinates and gives you the rank. So within a Cartesian communicator, which you have created, you can ask what is the rank of uh, the process at certain coordinates. So you could say what is the rank of the uh, of the process at um, coordinates. So again, for Fortran programmers, everything's zero based. The rank starts at zero and the first position is zero, zero. I know it's going to drive four time programs crazy, but that's the way it is. You can ask what is the rank of the process at position one, three, it will say seven, or the inverse mapping is MPI card coords, which tells, gives you the coords of a particular rank. So you might say, what are the coordinates of uh, rank six? And it will say they're one comma two. So those are the obvious now, MPI cart coords and MPI uh, cart, uh, sorry, I finished. MPI cart rank and MPI cart coords. Now, what you're going to end up doing a lot here is you can see what you're going to do is you're going to, now it turns out that, at least in the, the default use of MPI, a standard use of MPI, even in a Cartesian topology, you don't say send a message up, send a message down, send a message left, send a message right. What you have, you still, st MPI send to a particular rank. You just use the normal send and receive. So, so these functions are just bookkeeping functions. And what you would end up doing a lot is saying, I'm rank six. What are my coordinates? I'm one, two. Then you would add and subtract one to get one, 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 three, zero, two, and two, two. And you'd have to ask, who are the ranks at one, one, two, two, one, three, and zero, two? So you'd be continually converting your rank to coordinates manipulating those coordinates and converting them back to ranks again. That's rather cumbersome. So MPI provides a single routine which says, who are my neighbors up and down in a particular dimension? 
And that, so you'd only have to, you'd have to say, who are my neighbors up and down in the first dimension? Who are my neighbors up and down in the second dimension? So it's just two simple calls and you get your four neighbors. And so the call, the call is called MPI car shift. It imagines you're shifting things left and right. So you give a direction, which is zero for the first dimension, one for the second dimension. You give a displacement, which is normally one. You're asking who your neighbors plus or minus one. And source is the person to the left and desk is the person to the right. So if I did, if I was rank six and I did MPI cart shift of uh, direction zero, so that's the first direction, the way it's drawn here, that's up and down. Displacement one, okay. Then it would say your neighbors uh, down is two and up is 10. So you get two and 10. And if you did it this way, you get, you get five and seven. If you did it in the, you can ask your next nearest neighbors if you want, but you're normally asking for displacement one and, and it gives you source is the guy to the left down the way and desk is guy to the right up the way, the person to the right. So that gives you your neighbors in a single call. And the nice thing about MPI can't shift, you say, what if you ask the rank for non-existent process? What if I ask with MPI can't shift, who's my neighbor in that dimension or that dimension? Well, the nice thing is that um, MPI can't shift respects the, the periodic boundary conditions. So if you ask your neighbor up in the first dimension here, it will wrap round to eight. But if you ask for your, your, your uh, uh, neighbor in the positive dimension in that direction, it will say it doesn't exist. And what it, what it means by it doesn't exist is it returns a special, uh, um, what happens if you ask for the rank of non-existent process? MPI returns a null processor called MPI proc null. And this is nice. MPI not proc null is a special process. It, it's a black hole, send and receive complete, complete immediately. The messages just disappear. And that's nice. It means you don't have to write special code for the boundaries. You say, who's my neighbor up the way? Send the message up the way. If that neighbor doesn't exist, if it's a, if it's off the, if, 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 if it's a periodic boundary condition, sorry, a non-periodic boundary condition, the message just disappears because you get MPI out a prop now. So the other nice thing about using Cartesian topologies is it allows you to cope with the, the boundary conditions elegantly. You don't have to write special code for the edge cases because you get MPI prop null when you shouldn't send or receive a message and that just works. So are there any questions about that? There was one point I wanted to make clear for Now, the reason why, and I don't cover it in this course, but, but the reason that why um, Cartesian topologies are even more useful than they used to be is that they have relatively recently in introduced a new um, bunch of collectives, which I don't cover in this course, called neighborhood collectives. And that is the American spelling. And in a neighbor, so in a, in a neighborhood collective, you can say, send a message to all my neighbors. And what it will do is you provide a Cartesian topology. It will, you just say, send a message to all my neighbors and MPI will automatically look up who the neighbors are from the Cartesian topology. So although this, you, you can argue it's point of opinion whether Cartesian topologies are, how useful they are in normal standard MPI compared to doing the bookkeeping yourself. I, I, would, I would argue they are good because you're doing standard bookkeeping that everyone else will do. You don't use your own conventions and stuff, but you could just do the bookkeeping yourself. However, if you use neighborhood collectives, um, so it always, so, so if you, um, if you a, a negative disk just switches the neighbors around. If I ask my neighbors with that with with disk equals minus one, I'll get A and B. If I ask my neighbors with disk equals plus one, I'll get B and A. It just switches switches them around. Does that um does that answer your question? It always returns both neighbors. Does that make sense? And you don't have to use them both. You might only want to know your up your down neighbor, but it always gives you, 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 you give a direction, a displacement. So it always returns both, yes. It always returns both, yeah. Yes. Does that answer the question? Yeah, right, okay. So another useful thing is uh, once you've, 
you can imagine that um, imagine I've got a Cartesian topology. So the processes are uh, I've got a four by two grid here, for example, of processes. So one process owns all those four lanes, another one those four, another those four, another those four. Okay. Uh, so different processes own different sections of each lane. If I wanted to compute the total number of moves, the total number of cars that move, yeah, I could do an MPI or reduce. And that would, every, but if I want to do, um, I might want to want to know the number of cars that have moved in each lane. So what I want to do is I want to do a summation across all the processes, uh, independently summation across these processes, across these processes, across these processes, across these processes. How could you do that? There, there is no routine MPI or reduce across a row of processes, but there is a way to use MPI or reduce to do separately a reduction across those processes, those ones, those ones, and those ones. And I do have somebody at the door, so I'll just be to, but think about that. How could you use MPI or reduce to separately compute sums across those rows of processes? So apologies. So actually, uh, Christopher, Collier, to find a comp for each row and reduce or not comp, absolutely. So that's why all reduction operations take communicated like So how do we produce a communicator for each row? Well, when we have a Cartesian topology, we, we could slice it. We could say, just slice the communicator across a particular dimension. And so there is a routine to do that. And you, that's what you would do in this. In this, you would say MPI cart. Once you've got a Cartesian topology, it makes sense to say split it into separate communicators for each row, for each column. So a new communicator is produced for each slice, and each slice can then perform its own collective communications. So, for example, MPI, MPI cart sub, which was MPI cart um, uh, subset, I guess it stands for, generates new communicators for the slices. And it's a slightly strange syntax using an array to specify which dimension should be retained in the new communicator. It's slightly confusing because if you have a 3D grid, you could partition it into, into slabs in either dimension, but you could also partition it into lines. You could, you, if you had an L by L by L grid, you could, you could partition it to L slabs of size L squared or L squared lines each of size L. Um, you, would, you would then say, I want to get rid of two dimensions and only, and only, only retain one. You need to look at the syntax, it's a bit tricky, but I hopefully you understand the con exactly as Christoph said, to find a con for each row and reduce on that con. And that you can be doing by using MPI cart sub. So MPI cart sub, you give it the communicator, you tell it which dimensions will remain. So in the, the way I've drawn it, that will be the second dimension would remain and, and you would split across the first one and you get back a new, every process becomes a member of a new communicator. And then as, as Christoph suggested, you could do an all reduce across that communicator. So that's why, that's why communicators are very powerful. Uh, they allow uh, things like uh, reduction operations to be much more general than you might otherwise have, have, have thought they were. So the exercise is slightly fake, okay? The exercise is to rewrite the message passing around a ring using a one dimensional book. Now, in a one dimensional topology, it's not hard to compute your neighbors. X, rank plus one, rank minus one, modulo the periodic boundary conditions. But if you do it with the Cartesian topology, it at least allows you to see how to use the syntax. And there is an exercise that it, it, it's, it's fun to maybe make the periodicity true or false, and then you convert from being an up from doing an all reduce to a scan uh, automatically if you do it correctly. So, really, the exercise it, it is easier just to say my neighbor is rank plus one and rank minus one for the 1D thing, uh, but, but this exercise is there to um, at least show you how to use the syntax. So, are there any questions?
if there aren't, I was just going to briefly, um, maybe a few minutes, uh, just I'll, I'll spend five minutes just, just maybe talking you through the solution to the previous example. Um, so I will have to get those examples. Uh, give me one sec. I do apologize for this. So if I, 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 I will now have to share the right window. Uh, So, okay, hopefully you can see that. I can get the art. But that's just the solutions. MPP solutions.tar. I just see the, uh, let's do the, the Fortran one. Uh, sorry, MPP. And it's called uh, rotate. Uh, this just does a very, very simple, oh, it's very old fashioned, I should not make these, that's very naughty, I should do it, I should really do it to use. But what we do is basically we have uh, a bunch of our normal um, uh, MPI variables and we, MPI and MPI complex, we, we, we compute our neighbours, left is right minus one, left is right plus one, modulo the wraparound. We initialize to zero, and then we do okay, two I equals one to size. I send to my upward neighbor, and that's a non blocking, so I get a request back. I receive from my downward neighbor, and I do a wait, and then I can do this. Now, uh, somebody was actually, uh, is it, why is some people just have one variable? Okay. So what I want to say, some people just have this, let's just call it add-on. They might say something like add-on equals rank, and then they do, they just do. Okay. Why is that why is that wrong? That's what a lot of people do, and I was trying to why is that wrong? Yes, add on might be over by the receive call. Now, in fact, in fact, you probably get away with it in this example for technical reasons. But what you won't get away with is this one. If I do MPI, I, if I do the equivalent of I receive, I do I receive, okay. Um, oh, add on uh, com. Error, then MPI send of oh, add on one MPI. Uh, actually, actually, this is the add on supposed to left, left, right. And then I do an MPI wait, okay. That is almost definitely going to go wrong. So let's have a look at what we get for this. Let's see if we can. FTN minus O would take that F90 would take up. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, I mean, that. Oh, slash. So I'm just running on four dots, slash, what they call it, rotate. I do this on the fly, it's always dangerous. So we're supposed to get six. Um, I may have messed this up actually. It looks like it. Okay. Okay, so we get nine, so we get we get so we got 
9669. Let's run it again. So that's wrong, but not only is it wrong, it's probably, uh, yeah, we get random results. And that's always the sign of a, of, of, of a synchronization error that you have, you know, not only you're getting wrong results, but even worse than that, you're getting random results. That's very dangerous. So we have to do what the original code said. So we have to have separate values. Pass on equals rank. We send on pass on, and we do pass on equals add on. So we, we, we receive into a different variable than what we send to. And uh, then, so I believe, that this code should work. Again, it's always dangerous to, um, uh, to do things live, but I thought I would be brave. Except. There you go. So non-blocking communications in MPI is one of the few times, sorry, in MPI, the use of non-blocking communications is one of the few times that you get uh, non-reproducible results, different answers. Normally, if you get something wrong in an MPI program, you either get completely the wrong result, or most of the time it just deadlocks and doesn't work at all. But with non-blocking communications, it is very possible to write code that runs but is incorrect because you have these subtle timing issues. So you do need to be careful. You do need to be careful. Now, if you did the add-on, add-on thing by using non-blocking send, you get away with it. Okay? You happen to get away with it here, but you're just lucky. You're just lucky. You wouldn't in general get away with it. Um, so that's me finished. We can take a fuck. Now, I see that Mark is online. Mark, do you want to check that your audio is working? It was my audio, which I had problems with. So maybe it's worth. Sure. How's that? Does it sound okay? Um, with you, Mark? And I'll stop sharing in case I hog the screen. Okay. Uh, I'm actually probably going to leave right now. So I think uh, that's me um, finished for today. We've got Mark now. Then we've got the break from um, three to half three and half three to half four. My colleague Adrian, who well is supposed to be on the same meeting I'm going to, in which case he wouldn't have been available. He's having to self isolate because of family family COVID issues, the poor guy. So he's, he's not able to travel, which is, but that's lucky for you, you'll get Mark, um, sorry, Mark is lecturing for the next few quarters of an hour, but the final session, half three to half four, will be supervised by Adrian, who's also an expert in MPI. Uh, so that, that's a good opportunity to speak to Adrian. Uh, and so I will leave you now and pass over to, to Mark. Uh, leave the recording running, Mark. Maybe turn the recording off after your lecture, it's not, it's not essential, but probably okay. No, it makes it easier to edit afterwards if it's not yeah. three miles long. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thanks, David. Have a good trip. Okay. Great. So this lecture is about derived data types. So I'm just going to look back again over the basic types uh, and then we'll look at uh, the derived types. I'm going to focus mostly on vectors and structs because they're the ones which are, uh, are most commonly used. So please feel free to type questions in the, in the chat box as usual as, uh, as we go along. Okay. So, um, so far what we've seen able to do with, uh, with basic data types. So for example, if we, have, uh, if we have an array of integers, then we can, for example, if we want to send the whole array, then we can do that, M MPI send, we just, uh, just pass, pass X and the, the number of elements in the array. We could also, if we want, we don't have to send the whole array. We can just send the first four values, for example. Um, and so you know, we can uh, we can specify, uh, we could equally well specify the first element 
of the array as the argument rather than the name of the array. It doesn't matter, either will work in this case. Uh, and then just send four elements. And we can also, for example, send a contiguous piece of the array that doesn't start at the beginning. So again, all we need to do is pass the address or the first element that, uh, that we want to send uh, and then the, the number of elements. That's okay, but it's a bit limiting. Um, so for example, you know, what, we, what would we do if we wanted to send uh, some non-contiguous subset of, of elements? Uh, and what would we do if uh, instead of, uh, if the um, array consists not of basic types, but of some, uh, some struct or uh, type that we've constructed inside the program? So basically, those are those are the two kind of key issues that uh, that we're trying to that we that we'd like to solve. We'd like to be able to do those things, um, and that's what uh, MPI derived data types essentially allows us to to do. Okay, so just by way of some motivation, so the send and receive calls need a data type argument. And for, uh, for all the predefined language types, we have predefined values in, in MPI. So for example, you know, we have MPI real corresponding to reals, MPI int corresponding to ints. But what about types that we've defined ourselves? So you know, if we have user-defined types or struct or whatever, how can we handle those? Uh, and the, the other problem is that you know, send and receive calls take a count parameter, but what do we do about data that isn't contiguous in memory? Uh, can we still send it in a, in a single message um, without having to send lots of different, uh, lots of pieces in, in, different, uh, in different messages? And one of the common use cases for that is sending subsections of uh, well, 2D arrays or in general, multi-dimensional arrays. And so the, so the most common use case of that is to do halo exchanges. So for example, we might have two-dimensional arrays or three-dimensional arrays. Uh, and what we want to send is either, so the edges of our two-dimensional array or the faces of our three-dimensional array. Uh, want to send those and send and receive those, uh, we'll exchange those with our neighboring processes. And in some of those dimensions, those edges or faces are, are not contiguous in memory. So when this works in MPI, is it, this MPI allows us to define new types, so new MPI types, okay? Uh, and the way this has to work is that as a user, what we do is we call setup routines to describe a new data type to MPI. Uh, and it has to be done like this because M MPI is a library and, and, and not a compiler. Okay? So we can't declare types, MPI types, we basically have to call MPI functions that describe them. And then MPI returns us a, a new data type handle which we can store in some variable. Um, so for example, we can call it what we like, maybe MPI my new type. And then those newly defined derived types have the same status as, as the predefined types. In other words, they can be used in any message passing call. So wherever we need a, uh, an MPI type, we can use not only the predefined ones, but we can use anything that uh, any MPI, new MPI type that we've defined ourselves. Um, there's one case where we need to do something extra as well, uh, and that's for reduction operations. So in that case, we not only need to describe the type, but we also have to tell MPI how to combine two elements of that type. So we need to define a, a, an MPI op appropriate to the new to the new data type to tell how to combine them. Okay, I'm not not actually going to cover that uh, in, in this in this 
uh, lecture today. Um, but it's just, just a reminder that, uh, that you also need to do that for, for reductions. So when we're defining types in MPI, it's quite useful to understand how MPI represents them in, internally. Uh, and what the way it's done is that all these derived types are, are stored by M MPI uh, as basically as a list of basic types uh, and their displacements in bytes. So it's, uh, it's a list of uh, for each element that's that's inside the derived type. It has a basic type uh, and and there's also an offset or a displacement which says you know, how many how far away is does that thing live in memory from the the start of the, the start of the type okay. and you know if it's if we're dealing with a structure then the types can be different if it's for example an array subsection then the types will all be the same Uh, and what makes this system really powerful is that we can nest types. So we can define new derived types in terms of both basic types and of other derived types. So that allows us uh, really as much flexibility as we like to build up arbitrary descriptions of, of data, uh, of what type it is and, and how it's laid out in memory. Okay, so it's just to illustrate that what it looks like in, internally to, to MPI is basically essentially uh, a list of uh, a list consisting of basic data types and a displacement for each of them to say how far away it is from the from the start of the of the pattern. Okay, so the first one we're going to look at is actually a, a pretty simple one. And you might think at first sight, well, this is useless because we can we can do that anyway. <clears throat> uh, and that's contiguous data types. So the simplest derived data type just consists of a number of contiguous items of the same data type. Um, so uh, this is called MPI type contiguous. And so what we, what we pass it is just a count uh, and the existing type and we get back uh, in, in this, we get back a handle uh, to, to the new type. And as usual, same in Fortran plus the, uh, plus the error parameter. So you might think, well, why would I need that? I can already send contiguous chunks of, of data anyway with, with plain old uh, send and the inbuilt types. Well, a few reasons. One, it might make your program clearer to read. Um, so, you know, you have choices now. Instead of, if you want to send a set of a block of four integers, uh, you can either use MPI SN, say, with MPI int or int, MPI integer and, and a count of four, or we can define a new contiguous type of four integers, say, and, and call it what we like, so call it block four, uh, and then we can use MPI send with a type of block four and, and a count of one. Okay, well, is that nice or not? Um, bit of a matter of coding style. Um, might make your code a bit clearer as to, as to what you're doing. Uh, more usefully, perhaps, it's also, uh, it helps us as an intermediate stage in building more complicated types. So it can be useful as part of this process of, of building up a, uh, a complicated nested, nested type. There is actually a, another reason for, for this, uh, which is a slightly odd one, is that if you want to send very, very large messages, in MPI, then because the count parameter is a, is is essentially an, a a thirty two bit integer, uh, eventually, if you if you start sending gigabytes of data in, a, in an MPI message, then the value and you and you do it in in basic types, then the count will actually get too big, 
the count, count will overflow the, 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 the 32 bit integer. Uh, and so one way to get around that is to define some contiguous types which are not too big. Okay, so you could define a contiguous type that was maybe say, say order of a megabyte. Uh, and then you would send a few thousand of those. Um, and then you've got, you've basically got two count parameters to, to play with, uh, each of which will, can then be, can then, then, then fit into, into the 32 bits. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so let's move on to, to vector data types. So what does a vector data type look like? Okay, so it allows us essentially to have um, blocks, contiguous blocks of existing data types, uh, and then to build, and then to have a, a type which consists of multiple blocks of those with a, a constant offset between them. So uh, we basically essentially got three parameters to, to play with here. Um, so essentially it says, okay, um, we've got the number of elements in a block. Okay, so in this case, if this is my, if this is my existing old type, which could, be a, uh, could just be a, a basic type like a double, uh, then we can construct a data type where we have blocks of three doubles, for example, here. Okay, uh, and then we have a gap of two, and then we have another three, and then a gap of two, and so on and so on. Um, so the important parameters here are the the uh, the length, the number of elements in a block. So that's the block length, the stride. So that's the distance between the start of successive blocks. So in that's in this case, this is five elements. Uh, and then the number of blocks. So that's just the count. So in this case, we've got three elements per block, a five element gap between the start of each block uh, and a total of two blocks. So why is this useful? Well, uh, why is it defined like this? Well, the really, uh, the really important use case is that uh, one of these types essentially corresponds to a subsection of a two-dimensional array. Now, in order to get our heads around this, we have to think about or remember how, how arrays are, are stored in memory. Okay? Uh, and confusingly, they have the conventions are, are different for, for C uh, and Fortran. One important point here is that essentially we have to use statically allocated arrays in C, okay? Because dynamically allocated arrays have no defined format. And essentially you can't, if you, uh, if you, if you dynamically allocate uh, a sort of full uh, two-dimensional arrays in C, so really that's just a, a basically uh, uh, an array of pointers, then you have no guarantee that the whole two-dimensional structure is, is contiguous in memory. There is a way around that to do dynamic allocation. Essentially, you can, you can dynamically allocate the entire memory for the two-dimensional array, uh, and then you fix up the, the pointers into it. But you can't, so you, you, you can do it dynamically, but you can only ever have one mallet core uh, to make sure that the, the entire thing is, is contiguous in memory. Fortran's much nicer because arrays are kind of special in some sense. They're just not, they're not just pointers to, to arbitrary bits of memory. Uh, and you can use either, either static or, or allocatable arrays in Fortran. Okay. So in order to talk about this, it's helpful to, to pick a coordinate system. 
um, say there's some, some arbitrary choices to make here. Um, but um, so if I'm going to say, okay, for a two dimensional C array that's indexed, so first index I, the second index J, okay, I'm, I'm going to draw the layout with I running horizontally and J running up vertically. And same for similarly for Fortran of X, I, J as the array element in, in Fortran, then I can describe it this, the, the same way. Okay, so it's important to, you know, just, just to emphasize here, you, can, you know, how, how you choose to draw two dimensional arrays and you know, which way is, which is, which, which is the X direction, which is the Y direction, do they go left or right or up or down? Um, that's entirely up to you, okay? Uh, it doesn't change, it's just a convention and you can pick whatever you like and it doesn't change the way the thing is actually laid out in memory. Um, you know, so the one I've, well, the one that, there's a, there's a David slide, so the one that he's chosen is to, go, is, is to basically go uh, I rightwards and J upwards. Okay, so that's kind of a co coordinate space convention. Um, you can also go, you, know, you can also go down, down I and right in J. So that's more like how you would represent a matrix. Um, or you can go right and down. So that's more like how you would, uh, how you would represent uh, uh, a two dimensional image, for example. Um, so it's important, it's just important to say, it's, 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 uh, it's important not to get hung up about what the representation is because you know, a, a two-dimensional array can, can represent, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to represent a matrix, it can represent other things. And even if you do rep use a two-dimensional array to represent a matrix, it's completely arbitrary as to which way around you choose to, uh, to, you choose to do it. However, the important thing to notice or to remember is that it doesn't matter how you draw them, uh, the layout in memory is that in C, the rightmost index is contiguous in memory. So the next set of bytes after xij is xij plus one in C. And in Fortran, it's the other way round. So in Fortran, it's the leftmost index which is in memory. So the next, the immediately next set of bytes after xij is xi plus 1j. Okay, uh, as I say, if you if you do malloc, then then things are more complicated. Um, so you have to you have to be careful. Um, say so depends how you draw them. You 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 some there are. People like, some people like to describe, uh, you know, the, the C and Fortran layouts as row major or column major. Personally, I, I tend to avoid that because, you know, because of this problem, it says, you know, it's entirely, uh, it's, an, it's entirely a matter of convention, how you choose to do the mapping between the, uh, the two dimensional array uh, and whatever the conceptual data structure it is that you're using to represent it. So the upshot is that, okay, so you know, if we have a one dimensional array, then everything's straightforward, okay? Every, the elements are just contiguous in memory. But if we have a two dimensional array, okay, uh, and I stick to my uh, I goes rightwards, J goes upwards convention, then in C, the ordering of memory goes, starts at the bottom left corner uh, and goes up the first column and then down to the bottom again, up the second column and so on. It goes that way around. And in Fortran, it's the opposite way around. And so uh, for, if we have Fortran with uh, an index F, uh, we have XIJ, then uh, the, the layout goes contiguous across the first, across the bottom row. And then we move up to the, to the next row and go across and so on. It goes that way around. 
So in both cases, the if these are statically if these are statically declared arrays, the data is guaranteed to be contiguous in memory. Um, but the the ordering the index ordering convention is 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 different for uh, for C and Fortran. Okay, so back to vector data types. So suppose we want to construct a, uh, a, a vector data type that describes the interior of this five by four array. So if we unwrap that and lay it out in, in memory order, then that, this is basically what it looks like, okay? Because we're going up column first, up the first column, then up the second column, and so on, okay? So if we unwrap that out into, into the order in which it's stored in memory, it, it looks like this, okay? And so what, what we've actually got is we've got three blocks, each consists of two elements, uh, and then there's, there's a gap of two elements between the, between the blocks. And for the same example in Fortran, it's the other way around. So if we um, if we unwrap this as a Fortran array, then the memory layout goes across the bottom row first. So we end up with uh, with a different pattern. So uh, now we've got blocks of we've got we've got blocks of three elements. There are two blocks, um, but the gap is still two. So these are the, the two data types that we would we would want to construct. Um, so for our top one is for C. Okay. So we'd have a block length of two, a stride of four, uh, and a count of three. And in Fortran, we would have a block length of fruit of three, a stride of five, uh, and a count of two. And those are the parameters that we need to pass to M MPI type vector. The count, the block length, the stride, uh, and the uh, existing type of the elements. And then we get back this, again, we get back a handle to the, uh, to the new type that we've just described. Okay. So we've used the vector type to define a three by two subsection of a five by four array, but we haven't actually defined which subsection. Is it the middle one or does it start at the bottom left hand corner or is it the top right one? So the data that's actually sent uh, depends on what buffer you pass to the send routines. So what we need to do is we pass the address of the first element that we want to send. Okay, so uh, if we if we have this the example we had before, where it's the middle block we want to send, okay, and we've constructed our uh, our three by two data type, then basically we need to pass the uh, the address of the of the first element, which is uh, which is the bottom left one. Okay, um, so in, in C, that would be uh, the address of X11, uh, uh, or in Fortran, it would be, it would be X22. But we can use the, exactly the same data type to send a different three by two block just by changing the, uh, the, the first element that we pass. So if we wanted to send this block instead, okay, then it's just a question of figuring out what the index is, what the indices are for the for the for the first element, uh, and then passing those. So it would be 
uh, address of x21 in, in, in C or uh, x32 in Fortran. Okay. Now Christoph quite rightly comments, this all looks very awkward. Is there no facility just to send slices of arrays? Uh, no, <laughs> you have to do it like this. <laughs> the alternative is just, to, is just to declare, I mean, you can, the other way to do it if you want is you can just declare a, uh, a separate contiguous buffer and just manually copy the elements out of your multi-dimensional array into a one-dimensional buffer uh, and then send that, um, which is you know, arguably worse. Um, so you don't have to use data types, um, but you, um, yeah, no, there's, there's no way, to, there's no way to do this. Okay, you cannot pass uh, well, in Fortran, you, you know, for, for Fortran has subarrays as built in as part of the language. You can't just pass a, um, a subarray into, into MPI. I guess it looks awkward. Um, I, I guess the saving grace is that in, in most applications, then, you know, you can, you need to build a few, you typically need to build a few data types at the start of the program. Um, but then you just get to reuse them for, uh, for all the communications. So, you know, it's, you don't need to build one of these every time you do a send, you can just build them once and, and then reuse them throughout the throughout the program. Um, but yes, it, it is all a bit grung, grungy and awkward. Okay, um, so little utility routine is uh, is M MPI type get extent. So sometimes it's useful just to find out how big a derived type is. Okay, so th this this is basically the uh, it tells you the distance in bytes between the start of the first entry and and the end of the last one. Okay, so that's vectors. Let's let's look at structures now. Um, so uh, both um, C and Fortran let us define our own data types, compound objects. Um, so you know, either either structs or um, user-defined types in, in Fortran. Now, you, th you thought vectors were bad. Wait, wait till you see this. Okay. Now the problem here is that the uh, the storage format is not defined by the language, okay, in, in the sense that um, you know, different compilers may store these, may, may store these things differently. Um, so in particular, they may uh, insert arbitrary padding between successive ele elements. Uh, so, in, you know, for, in this example here, so if, if this is basically a you know, a, a four byte integer followed by a, an eight byte double, then uh, some compilers, in fact, probably most compilers will probably insert uh, a, a, four, a four byte pad, piece of padding in between the, in between the int and the double. 
to make sure that the double is is aligned on a on an eight byte boundary um, because that essentially makes the the memory accesses to that to the to the double more more efficient. So in order to construct a an MPI data type for this, we need to be able to to actually figure out what those displacements are and and tell MPI the the byte displacements of, of every every element. Um, so we need to be able to tell MPI, you know, where does this double start in in relation to the to the beginning of the whole structure. So in this case, in order to construct a, a struct data type, we call MPI type create struct. Uh, and in this case, um, it basically, to, so we have a count, uh, and then, then we also have to pass it an, an array of block lengths, uh, and also an array of, uh, array of displacements, and an array of types. And then we get back our, get our handle back. Okay, so for the for that example, okay, so in this case, the uh, the the count would be two because there's there's two elements in the structure, an int and a double. Okay, um, block lengths would be okay. There's, there's an int and a uh, there's an int and a, 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 a an array of three sorry there's an int and array of three doubles here. So the first block length is one, okay, because there's one integer, uh, and it's of type MPI int. Uh, and then for the, the second block length is of length three, because there's, there's an array of three doubles, uh, and that's of MPI type double. Okay. Um, so how do we compute the displacements? Okay. So this is, you know, this is the really ugly bit. What we have to do is we actually have to create one of these things in our program. Okay, so we have to declare one, so that there's a there's a real one that we can uh, we can inquire about. There's an actual instance of them, uh, and then explicitly, essentially, explicitly compute the memory addresses of each members of the struct, and then subtract those to get displacements from from the origin. So so this is this is this is really really grungy and hor horrible. Um, but rather than deal with raw pointers here, uh, then uh, MPI has this uh, notion of uh, uh, how has an in, in, has, a, has its own representation of addresses rather than just raw pointers. Um, so if we we can do this, so we have this function called MPI get address. Um, so if we pass it a memory location, so if we pass it a pointer uh, or a, or, a, or a name of a uh, uh, name of a variable, or in this case, the name of a member of a struct, uh, then we can get we get back uh, an uh, an address in a, in a predefined MPI type called called uh, MPI A int, which is designed to hold addresses. So that's not very nice. Okay. Um, once we've defined a data type, so if that's contiguous type, vector type, struct type, whatever, once we've uh, once it's been constructed, we have to we have to commit it, uh, so called, um, by before we actually use it. Okay. So we basically have to. Uh, it's a way of saying, okay, this is we're now done constructing this thing. Um, is you can this is this is something I actually want to use in in subsequent sends receives collectives whatever uh, we can then we have to say okay MPI type commit uh, the the data type and, and then we can use it. Okay. Um, any questions before I say a little bit about the, the derived data type 
exercise. Yeah. And Fortran is a name data type really an int. Yes, it's a handle, basically. It's just another it's it's just another one of these MPI handles. How does a declaration look like using this? So you don't use this to declare. You don't use this to to declare this in um, in the actual program. Okay, you just you use this is just the thing that you pass to uh, passes the type in in MPI send and receive and collectives and so on. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, so if you've got structs and things, you just declare them as you would a struct. And this is just this the uh, the MPI data type is just the way to describe that thing to MPI when you actually want to you know, as you want to send and receive them. Okay, so the next exercise is that uh, uses this is basically say is take your passing ring, your passing around the ring exercise, uh, and instead of just doing it with a with a basic type with an integer, you uh, calculate two separate sums. So one is an integer and one is one is and calculate the same sum uh, but using uh, a floating point value. Uh, so and use a so create create yourselves a struct uh, cons which contains one integer and one and, and one float to do that, uh, and then set up the, the the struct data type that that allows you to pass that around. Uh, so for Fortran programmers, if you're uh, you know if if you're not not into derived types, then uh, you can skip. You, know, you feel free to skip this and uh, and go on to the one that. Uh, the next one, which uh, which uses the the vector types, that's probably uh, that might might be more useful for you. Okay, so if there aren't any any more questions, uh, I'll wrap up there. Uh, got half an hour break, just over, and Adrian will be here at uh, at half past the hour uh, to help you out with with the uh, with the practical session for the for the rest of the day. Okay. Um, thank you very much, everybody, and I'll, I'll hope to see you for the final session uh, next week. <laughs>